Hi guys, we're back. Back this time to talk more about EKG interpretation. And in order to understand what we're going to talk about today, it's very important that you refer to session 16. Today it's going to be atrial fibrillation, cardioversion, and junctional rhythms. Let's first start with atrial fibrillation. In order to understand atrial fibrillation, it's very important to understand a normal EKG has a P, a QRS, and a T. And that was discussed in the first uh, session on EKG interpretation. The sinoatrial node, as we know it, is the one that triggers that impulse which causes the atria to contract. And that's why we have a P wave. Well, if it doesn't happen, for whatever reason, damage, perhaps, to the sinoatrial node, an irritable focus in the atria might take over its work, causing uh, waves like an atrial fibrillation. Here we see there is no P wave, which means the atria did not contract. What we have, in essence, is a coarse, wavy line. Yes, you have a QRS, coarse, wavy line, QRS, coarse, wavy line, and it's very irregular. It's usually very rapid, too. It's usually slowed with drugs like uh, amiodarone. Well, the problem with atrial fibrillation, the atria is quivering, and this is dangerous, which means that it's not contracting and emptying effectively. This can lead to blood clots, which can travel to the brain and cause a stroke. Heparin therapy is often used as a form of treatment for these patients. It does not dissolve the clot. What it does, it prevents blood clots from forming. We also have atrial flutter, which is less common, but follows the same pattern as atrial fibrillation. And one thing that's very clear, there is a very clear sawtooth configuration on the base of the EKG, as you can see here. You have what you call flutter waves. And you can see that you can count these flutter waves, one, two, three. There's a QRS, one, two. Here's a QRS, one, two. Very distinct sawtooth flutter waves can be seen on the EKG. But the treatment is pretty much the same because they follow the same pattern. Then we're going to talk about cardioversion versus defibrillation. The equipment that's done to cardiovert or defibrillate a patient is pretty much the same, but it's used differently. The patient who is defibrillated is usually, it's an emergency situation. That patient is in cardiopulmonary arrest, what is often referred to as a cold blue. And it's done as an emergency Higher doses of uh, shock treatment will be used, joules like 200, 360 to shock that patient, depending on what the doctor tells you to do. And <clears throat> it's usually done under life-threatening circumstances. Unlike a cardioversion, which is done for uh, atrial fibrillation, the patient is not in a rhythm that is really as lethal as it happens with defibrillation. It's done in a synchronized manner. It's done when you have to wait for the R wave. The doctor usually takes care of all this, waits for the R wave to shock that patient, and the hope is that it will convert that patient back into his normal rhythm, which is usually sinus rhythm. You can take a look here and see the nurse's assistant, the doctor. The doctor's got her paddle. She shouts all clear. And to learn more about this topic, I suggest you go to the clinical settings step-by-step, step, dearnurses.net, and Chapter 14 will make it really easy for you to understand. In the meantime, we're going to talk about junctional rhythms. What causes a junctional rhythm? Well, there are numerous causes, coronary artery disease, a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, heart surgery, as you can see here, this patient is having surgery, drugs like digoxin, and also electrolyte imbalances. What would you expect to see on the EKG? Remember, the SA node is where you have the SA node fires, the atria contracts, and that gives you the P wave. Well, if the SA node doesn't fire, the AV node makes an attempt to do its work, causing no P wave. In fact, what you're going to get is either a, an absent P, like in the case here, a P that's upside down, depending on where in the node, or you might get a P that comes behind the QRS. They all have different rates. You might be 40 to 60. Generally, rates coming from the junction are slower than those coming from the sinus, so from the SA node. So uh, you can see 60 to 100 here, 
like I said, you may not even have one at all, the P wave coming at all. Now, what would you expect to find in these patients? You find a patient who's complaining of feeling ch chest pain, shortness of breath, low blood pressure, which will lead to dizziness. If this should happen, you need to do an assessment, check your patient over, document your finding, get an EKG strip, document the time that you got that EKG strip. If the strip showed what that patient was feeling, which is what we're discussing, the uh, absence of a P at the time, just document the time that you got the strip. Usually these strips have the time that you get them and the date on them. Just put the patient's name on it and put it in the chart so that the doctor can take a look at it. Of course, you always notify the doctor of your findings. Then we will discuss PEA, which is called pulseless electrical activity. What happens in PEA, as you can see here, there's a P, a QRS, and a T. But the patient does not match the EKG. If there is a P, a QRS, and a T, why is this patient not responding? Well, that is because that patient, something is obviously wrong. And according, there are protocols in place, according to American Heart, ACLS protocols for treating such patients. You might find the most common cause is hypovolemia, which means low circulating volume of fluid. Often patients who have been exposed to trauma have low circulating volume. Hypoxia, which is low oxygenation. Hypothermia, which means the body temperature is extremely low. It might even happen after a trauma and massive blood loss. It might also happen after surgery. Then, of course, we have trauma like you can see here, a car accident, cardiac tamponade. That is when you have uh, some kind of damage to the heart and there's bleeding within the pericardial sac. Then the, we have drug overdose, thrombosis, which you know is a blood clot, tension pneumothorax, which can happen for various reasons. And so I urge you to go to the clinical settings step-by-step, step, dearnurses.net, and you'll find many topics to be very helpful that will help you to understand more about PEA. Hope you've learned something, and we hope to be back very soon with more situations on EKG reading. Have a nice day. So stay posted for more clinical situations soon.